first 15 verses of this chapter, as we continue this, uh, this journey that Paul and the disciples are on, right now we're finding them in their second missionary journey as they go into Asia Minor, and then now we're, we're in, uh, actually in Macedonia uh, as they continue preaching the gospel both to Jew and Gentile alike. But let's take a look at the text in Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. When they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. Some of the Jews were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a large number of God-fearing Greeks, and not a few prominent women. But the Jews were jealous, so they rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace, formed a mob, and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house in search of Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the crowd. But when they did not find them there, they dragged Jason and some other brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here, and Jason has welcomed them into his house. They are all defying Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowds and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. Then they made Jason and the others post bond and let them go. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. On arriving there, they went to the Jewish synagogue. Now the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Many of the Jews believed, as did also a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. When the Jews in Thessalonica learned that Paul was preaching the word of God at Berea, they went there too, agitating the crowds and stirring them up. The brothers immediately sent Paul to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed at Berea. The men who escorted Paul brought him to Athens and then left instructions for Silas and Timothy to join him as soon as possible. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We ask as we um, explore its meaning and its application to our life, God, that you might give us understanding, that you might give us an openness to your spirit, that whatever we've come in with of concern or anxieties or uh, worry, God, we don't uh, leave that at the door. God, we bring that to you right now in Jesus' name. As your word says, to cast all your care and anxiety on him because he cares for us. And Lord, we bring those concerns and we say in the midst of this message, God, may even some of the answers we're looking for be found through this text. Holy Spirit, have your way. Use this time and magnify the wonderful and glorious and matchless name of Christ. And we pray these things in Jesus' name and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I've entitled this message, What Are You Known For? Because... We have a number of characters that are, are really presented to us in this text. We've got Paul, we've got Silas, we've got Timothy, we've got a man named Jason, we've got a mob, we've got a riot, we've got city officials, we've got women, we've got men, we've got Jews, we've got Gentiles, we've got people that receive the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we have those that reject it. And then we have those that are, in a cursory fashion, interested in the word of God, like the Thessalonian church or the Thessalonian uh, city. And then we've got the Bereans, who are described as of more noble character than the Thessalonian area. And so we've got all of these things that these different people are known for. They have this reputation that has kind of been built around their life based on, of course, their behavior and their actions. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about Proverbs 22.1 that says, A good name is more desirable than great riches, and to be esteemed is better than silver or gold. In another passage, it says it's like the perfume, that a good reputation is like wonderful perfume. It's a fragrance that... that precedes you and follows you. No matter where you go, people, people know 
what your reputation is. It's amazing how a reputation, you can work on it for so long uh, and, and develop a good one, and in a matter of minutes, it's gone. And we've seen that. If you've been watching uh, TV or listening to radio recently, you know that there, there are people that in, in a matter of just a few words out of their mouth, and their whole life changes, their career changes. And I think about this Japanese proverb that I came across. It says that the reputation of a thousand years may be determined by the conduct of one hour. Isn't that interesting? And the fact is, is that all of us have a reputation. You might have a reputation for your vocation or your, uh, some talent or ability or a hobby, or some, some have some reputations of what they've accomplished in the past that they still, you know, you walk around and it's like, oh, I know who you are. You've done that. And yes, they have. Um, but whatever your reputation is, it's not just what you think it is or would like it to be, but it's what your behavior and actions uh, indicate. And, and the thing I want to encourage you as we go through this text is that I want to encourage you to get some consideration to your reputation. Now, one of the things that I want to say from the beginning, and I'm, I'm repeating myself at this point, but you have a great reputation. This fellowship has a really good reputation, and it's not because of me. It's the work of God in you. But you've made yourselves available to God in such a way that you've become known as a church that loves God and loves people. And those are the two greatest commandments that the Bible gives us, along with making disciples, and that's something our church is committed to. But on an individual basis, we also have a reputation. And um, as we go through this text, I want to encourage you to, to consider these various types of people that are in the text of this passage this morning and consider what kind of a man or what kind of a woman are you? How would you like to be known? Not what would you want to be known for, but what needs to happen in order for that to actually occur that that now is your reputation, and uh, certainly probably the most important aspect of that is your walk with God. Now, in this text, we're picking up a, a storyline of the first missionary journey of Paul and now the second missionary journey. In chapter 16, Paul had a vision, and the vision was, Paul, come to Macedonia. We need you. And that's all he got. It was a vision from God. And so Paul immediately, the Bible tells us, uh, broke camp and, and headed to Macedonia. And now he's in Macedonia, and he's already been kicked out of two, two, uh, two cities already, and he's only been there just a short time, and he's going to get kicked out of two more uh, before this, this text is over, and three more before this chapter is over. And so he, he's going through these, uh, these three cities, and it seems like it's just a little afternoon stroll, but there's 100 miles of, of traveling that takes place in verse 1 of chapter 17. But they arrive in Thessalonica, which is kind of a, a city center. It's a, it's a metropolis. It's one of the premier cities of Macedonia. And they're about a population of about 200,000 people that are there. And so it's a very strategic place to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul, what does he do? He does what he's been doing all along, is he goes into the synagogue of the Jews, and he sits down, and they read from uh, the Torah, they read from the Psalms or Proverbs, and they read from the prophets. And then the floor is open for anyone with skill or knowledge or, or any kind of credential to make commentary on that passage of Scripture. And because the whole Old Testament is just filled with, with prophecies about Christ, Paul would use these occasions as a gateway, an entryway, an open door for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul would just find the synagogue in the city, and he would make his way to that synagogue on the Sabbath, and he'd sit down, and, and he knew. He would just, Holy Spirit, fill me. Holy Spirit, give me the words. Give me the wisdom. And, and oftentimes, not even knowing what the text of Scripture would be read, and yet, because he was dependent on the Holy Spirit, he was able to preach the gospel from any passage in the Old Testament. And so Paul went through this process in this particular synagogue, and the Bible tells us in this uh, verses 1 through 3 that he reasoned with them. It's the word dialegomai in the Greek, where we get our English word to dialogue with someone. So Paul was preaching, but it was more of a dialogue. He would read from the scripture and say, I want to share with you how Jesus fulfills this prophecy. There are over 300 Old Testament prophecies about Jesus being the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah of God. And so he would teach on that, and then he would dialogue with them. There would be this back and forth, questions being asked, Paul giving answers, pointing to another passage in Scripture, questions being asked, Paul answering. The people were completely blown away. This whole concept of Christ, Jesus, being the, the, the Messiah was foreign to them. And so Paul was opening their hearts and opening their minds. The Bible tells us he did this for three Sabbaths. And what I like about Paul 
is that he didn't use some sort of a clever argument or an ingenious program. He didn't come with a PowerPoint presentation, you know, like look on the screen and let me, oh, there's a joke there and here's a funny story here and look at these pictures. What he did is it says he reasoned with them from what? From the scriptures, from the Bible. And I was, I was thinking about that because, of course, the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, that the word of God is powerful, it's active. It's like a two-edged sword. And in Romans 10, 17, it says that people come to faith through hearing the word of God in Christ. I want to I just share a thought that came to my mind as I was uh, preparing this message, and, I, and uh, I was thinking about how vital it is that people actually hear the Bible from us in our evangelism. You know, we can, we can be doing friendship evangelism forever. You know, I think sometimes friendship evangelism is wonderful, by the way. And, and basically, a definition of it is that you, you don't just, uh, you know, find strangers, but you work with the people that are in your circle of influence, you're friends with them, and through the testimony and the witness of your life and also your verbal communication of the gospel, you have an inroad into that person's life to be able to communicate to them and to also let them observe your life over a period of time. But I think sometimes relationship evangelism has has been kind of an excuse to not actually speak the Word of God to people. And, and we kind of like, well, how long have you been doing this relationship evangelism? Well, gosh, about five, five years now in my neighborhood, and yeah, I'm, I'm you know, just praying, and uh, well, have you been able to share the Word with them? Well, not yet, you know, we're, it's, not, it's not, not time yet, you know. And the, the thing I want to share with you is that Paul realize that it's got to be the Word of God. It's only the Word of God that brings people to faith. It's the, it's the revelation of the Scriptures and of the Gospel itself that helps people understand what the message is. So you can be nice for 10 years and 15 years and have a great reputation as a nice neighbor and everything else, but until the Gospel is presented, there can't be salvation. And so Paul is presenting the Word of God to them and reasoning with them from the scriptures. And it goes on to say that he explained and proved that Jesus had to suffer and that he had to rise from the dead. These were completely foreign concepts to the, to the uh, Jewish population. They, they were so confused by the Old Testament prophecies about the Messiah suffering that many of the Jewish uh, uh, teachers were separating and coming up with the idea that there were actually two separate messiahs, a forerunner to the messiah who would suffer and then the true messiah who would not suffer because they couldn't wrap their mind around the idea of both being one and the same person. They couldn't accept that the creator of the universe, the ruler of all kingdoms and all men and women, the one who reigns on high would come in human flesh and would suffer on the cross and die. It was beyond them. And so, because they couldn't grasp it, they actually developed a theology that was incorrect about the possibility of two separate people representing a singular person of Christ, the Messiah. And so, Paul was teaching them. And again, how did he do it? He went to the Word of God. He took the Scriptures. He went to places like Isaiah uh, 53. He went to uh, Psalm 22. And he went to all the passages about the birth of Christ and the resurrection of Christ and everything in between. His ministry, his suffering, his teaching, the miracles, all these things that the Christ would, would demonstrate, Paul explained to them from the Scriptures and said, do you see how Jesus did every one of these things? And so he was presenting, as Josh McDowell would say, evidence that demanded a verdict from these listeners in, this, uh, in the synagogue um, as they were reading on that Sabbath day. It's interesting, the word that's used here about proving, that Paul explained and proved. It's uh, dianoigo, where we get our word diagnosis from. I usually don't spend so much time talking about the, the Greek words, but when they're helpful, I want to I open them up to you. But Paul, in essence, was diagnosing the problem that these people had. It's like a physician. You know, you go into the doctor, doc, I don't know what's wrong. I, I feel lethargic. I don't feel good. I got stomach cramps or whatever. Something's not right. And the, the doctor begins to diagnose the problem and identify the problem. And, and he wouldn't be a, a really good physician if he didn't also provide a remedy for the problem. And when a, when a doctor tells you what the problem is, you're not like, that's so insulting. You know, I've got a stomach ulcer. How could you even say that to me? Do you know who you're talking to? I mean, you know, when we have a physician diagnosis, we're like, oh, well, that's not great news, but can it be, can it be repaired? Can we do something? And, oh, yeah, that's easy. You know, let me fill out a prescription for you. 
And in essence, the Apostle Paul, he was reasoning, having a dialogue with them. And I don't believe he just had a boilerplate presentation where he's just like, okay, these are my five points, and yeah, I'll tweak them a little bit. These people look a little bit different. Crowd age group, okay, I'll tell this joke, I'll say that, this thing. No, he didn't do any of that. He simply was led by the Spirit, reasoned with them, listened to them. He actually listened while he was sharing the gospel with them. And then he diagnosed the problem. And then he's able to present the solution, which, of course, Jesus Christ, do you know that Jesus Christ is a solution to every problem that a person has on the planet? So it's really easy to get someone to Christ when you diagnose the problem. But if you address a problem they don't have and say Jesus is the answer, you're completely missing it. Like, you know, oh, well, Jesus is going to make your life better. And the person says to you after you make your long spiel, it's like, man, I, I don't know if life could be any better. I'm just so happy. I don't have any problems. I, you know, thanks for sharing with me, though. And, and the problem is, is that we haven't dialogued and we haven't diagnosed because every man or woman, apart from Christ, has a problem. And if nothing else, it's a problem of separation from God. God wants to remedy that problem. And so Paul, skillfully, not because he's an expert or because he's smarter or brighter than we are, but because he's a man who knows this book and is able to diagnose the problems of people as he listens to them and cares for them and takes an interest in their life, he's able to present a reasonable defense for the faith and the remedy, which of course is Jesus Christ, the Messiah. This is the same thing, of course, Jesus did in Luke 24 uh, when he presented the word to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He kind of rebukes them and says, how, how can you guys not get this? And the Bible tells us that he began from the book of Moses and went through all the prophets and explained how he was the Christ. And so in essence, that's what Paul, Paul does in this synagogue. And so we find that uh, the, the culmination of all of this uh, uh, of this teaching of Paul is that Jesus is the Christ, the long-awaited, anointed Messiah of God. It, it, it really is a pivotal, pivotal central message of the teachings in the Bible. You remember when, uh, when Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? There was a turning point in the, in the ministry of Christ where he set his face toward Jerusalem after Peter said these words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. We find these same words being uh, preached by, by Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, when he comes to the end of his, his powerful message that God gives him on the day of Pentecost. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he's just, he's just laying it out. And this is the climax of his message. This is what he says. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When, uh, when the church is... Uh, teaching and going from house to house and in the, in the temple and in the synagogues and in, in homes, teaching. This is what it says about them in Acts 5.42. They never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. Every message that Paul teaches in the book of Acts, and one of them is in Acts 16 that we just did you know, a couple weeks ago, his whole thrust is toward this message that Jesus is the man. Jesus is the anointed one. Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Deliverer. Jesus is the one who died on the cross that we might be set free. Jesus is the answer and the, not only, he's the diagnosis and the answer to our malady. And our malady is sin. And uh, we had a, quite a few people last week receive Christ for the first time. And I just want to say, if there's anyone here today that you've never received Christ, and you're coming here and looking for some answers, I will tell you authoritatively from the Word of God that the diagnosis, don't be offended, Remember the physician story? Okay, the diagnosis is sin. That's our problem. And it, and, it, and it ruins us. And we're going to talk more about that in a little bit. But it ruins us and devastates everything in our life. It's, it's fun for a season, the Bible says, but then it brings death. But the remedy is available. The prescription has already been written in your name. All you have to do is pick it up and take it. And the prescription, the remedy is that you would receive Christ as your Savior, that you would recognize that he's the Lord, that he is the Christ, the promised one of God to redeem, to save, to deliver, to bring life, abundant life, eternal life. That's God's remedy, Jesus Christ. And it's the central core of the message of the Bible and it's certainly of the New Testament church. Well, in verse 4, we're told that um, there was a wonderful response. It says, Some were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks. These are, are Gentile converts to Judaism. And then also not a, 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 some Jews also. And then it says, interestingly, not a few prominent women. 
This is really the first time in the book of Acts where women are mentioned specifically as a, as a grouping of, of people that respond to the gospel. We have lots of places where lots of men, it says 3,000 men receive Christ, and so we're figuring, you know, even more because of women and children receive Christ. But on this occasion, Dr. Luke actually points out that not a few prominent women received the Lord and became believers and followers of Christ. Now, here, here's a question I have is, why would he make a point to draw out this unique fact that not a few prominent women responded. I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one is that these prominent women were probably well-educated. Being well-educated, they knew all about Greek philosophy and Greek religion and Greek mythology. And they had plumbed probably the depths of it and been with their husbands and, and sacrificed to all kinds of foreign idols and everything else. And they got to the point where they saw the, the despair and the emptiness in these false religions. More than that, in, in every religion, with the exception of Christianity, Women have a much lower place than men. But in Christianity, God elevates a woman in a way that women had never been elevated before. They were made equal with men in the New Testament through Christ. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, here in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek or slave nor free nor male nor female uh, nor slave nor free, but all are one in Christ. And suddenly the women are like, whoa, are you serious? We have a standing because in Greek mythology and, and in most of those pagan religions, women were just horribly abused. They were chattel. They were, they were nothing more than servants and slaves with no rights whatsoever. And Paul comes along and preaches the gospel and says, ladies, I have a message for you. And the thing I want to tell you is that the, these New Testament women were powerful in the kingdom. They were movers and shakers. These women, many of them, even at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry, they were the ones that helped support the ministry so that Jesus and the disciples could go out. They also worked. But they, these women, the prominent women, were supporting the work of ministry. And, and, and I want to say it hasn't changed. Even today, we have so many wonderful, beautiful, godly women in our fellowship who are serving the Lord. And um, while there's, a, there's a, a pattern of chain of command of leadership that God lays out as it relates to this issue of men and women in leadership, nonetheless, from a standpoint of your involvement and your participation in the kingdom of God, God says, you have great value. And God not only has used women in the past, he's using them today, and he's using you, the ladies here. And I'm, I can't say how thankful we are for your attention to your spiritual life, the attention you give to having quiet times in the morning and continuing to grow in your relationship with God, the attention you're giving to your children and raising them, the attention you're giving to the many uh, women in the church in ministering to them, the older women are discipling the younger women, the younger women are discipling ones that are even younger, you're caring for each other, you're winning your friends to Christ, you are a powerful, potent force in the kingdom of God and here in this church. And I want to thank you for your partnership in the gospel. You have a very important role, and that's what Paul is also saying here. So these women are just ecstatic. They're liberated, and they're affirmed and elevated in a way that no other religion ever could or ever will uh, transform women in their value before God. So, you know, all these people are responding. And what generally happens when God is just blowing things open and God, people are coming to Christ? What's probably going to happen next? Persecution. Persecution. Why? Satan just hates it when the kingdom advances. He gets really hopping mad when people are delivered and, and changed and suddenly their problem is diagnosed and they have a remedy. He wants everyone to stay sick for life and he, and he wants you to die of a terminal disease and it's called sin. He doesn't want you delivered. But Jesus wants you delivered. So when, when this remedy, it's like, you know, it's so simple. It's so, it's so available. It's so prepared. It's done and it's there. And he wants to hide it from people. But when people grab a hold of it and realize, my goodness, I wish I had known about this earlier, and they receive the remedy of Christ, and they're free, Satan is not happy. And so he, he, he gets hopping mad, he gets upset, and he starts to disrupt things. And that's what we ha find happens in verse 5 through 7. The Jews that were there, the Christ-rejecting Jews, were jealous. They were upset that Gentiles, these Gentile dogs, you know, these unworthy people, were receiving the kingdom. And they were also de determined to maintain their power and their position. And for those two reasons, they were upset and they were jealous. Now, I want to I talk about jealousy here just for a minute because we all get jealous. Uh, we might get jealous of somebody else that gets a promotion that we didn't get, we thought we deserved. 
We might be jealous because uh, if you're dating, someone else is, you know, there's another person in, in the, in the, on the scene that oh, he seems interested in, is he interested in me or interested in them? And there's a jealousy. Sometimes we get jealous when we find somebody else just succeeds at something. And it's like, man, how did they get to be so smart? And at first we're like impressed and then we become like irritated. <laughs> like, who are they anyway? Who do, I know what they're really like. I know about them. You know, we know, we know the dirt on them and we try to, in our own minds, you know, diminish their success because of jealousy. And I want to tell you three really simple remedies for, for jealousy uh, that are biblical. I, I wouldn't want to offer you anything else. But how do we respond when somebody else succeeds? Uh, instead of being jealous, the first thing that we can do is don't be intimidated by their success. Celebrate with them. Celebrate. You know, the Bible tells us rejoice with those rejoice. So when someone's rejoicing, don't try to, you know, uh, be the bucket of water on their, on their party. In fact, why don't you build it up a little bit? You know, what I found is that, is that if I celebrate with someone immediately, I'm a lot less likely to become jealous, you know? But if I sit on it long enough, you know, Satan can kind of work on you, and it's like, yeah, well, that was great, and boy, I'm kind of happy for him, but, you know, I just, how that was done wasn't quite right, and this might have been done differently, and all of a sudden, it's not such a great celebration anymore. But the first thing that the Bible tells us is that we are to rejoice with those that rejoice. One of the reasons we can do that as Christians is because we're so secure in our identity in Christ. The, the remedy has been so fulfilling and so complete that we no longer have to pull other people down in order to feel good about ourselves because we have a relationship with God. And so the first part of how we can respond to jealousy is simply just blow the roof off. You know, have a party for the person. Go around and say, hey, did you hear about so-and-so? Man, that was excellent. And do it in front of people. Celebrate. Do it with your kids. Do it with your wife. Do it with your husband. Do it with your neighbors. Do it with people at church. Do it at the workplace. It's a sign of a true, authentic Christian life. The second thing you can do is just remember the sovereignty of God. In Psalm 75, 5, it says, it's God who judges. He brings one down and he exalts another. So if God has exalted someone and you, and you get a little irritated about that and, and, and become jealous, what are you really saying? You're saying, I don't like, God, what you're doing. I don't like that you elevated this person. Why wasn't it me? Why wasn't it this other person? So just understanding the sovereignty of God and rejoice in God's choice. It's God's timing. Let him do what he wants without complaining. And the third thing is uh, just remember that this whole program is not about us. John 3.30. I love what John says when his disciples come to him and say, you know, John, they're trying to in in incite jealousy in John the Baptist. They tell him, hey, John, do you realize that these other guys, unauthorized guys, untrained guys, guys that aren't on our list, are baptizing people? What are you going to do, John? Can you, can you see it? It's like, you can see John, well, yeah, what am I going to do? But no, he says, guys, you've got this all wrong. He says, Jesus must increase and I must decrease. This is a man who learned how to push the praise to other people and in the appropriate places, especially to Christ. So jealousy is a pit. It rots the bones, the Bible tells us. It's, it's, uh, it's destructive. It has no place in the Christian life. But we can be proactive. We don't have to simply just try to, oh, stop, don't, oh, uh, nah. We can be proactive and actually take these steps of celebrating someone, else, someone else's success. We can remember the sovereignty of God, and then we can remember that it's not about us, and our job is to actually help other people succeed. That's our job. Do you realize that that's our calling? Our calling isn't to succeed. Our calling is to help other people succeed. And when we do that, we are successful. That's our calling. And so, um, but these guys didn't get that at all. They rounded up some bad characters from the marketplace. I mean, these are spiritual leaders that are doing this. And they're rounding up bad guys, you know, thugs in the marketplace. And uh, they formed a mob and started a riot. And they rushed Jason's house, who evidently this church was meeting in. They were having these times of fellowship in Jason's house. And they dragged him out before the city officials. And he accused them of several things. The first, that they were troublemakers. Now, it's interesting because in the um, RSV, it actually translate it, translates it, that they were turning the world upside down. And that's what the Greek actually means, that they were turning things upside down. Very interesting accusation. Um, I'm thinking about the fact that these men uh, were actually being accused accurately. This is one that, the, that, the, that these guys that were after them really had it right, that Paul and Silas and Timothy and all these disciples were turning the world upside down. The thing that these accusers didn't recognize is that the world was already upside down. 
The world is so upside down and it happened because of sin in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve and, it, and it's penetrated every aspect of human culture and human life so much so that that's why, you know, with all of the money, the billions and billions of dollars that even in just the United States we have for taxes, we can't fix hardly any problems. Have you kind of noticed that? We can't fix anything. We can't even fix our problems on Kauai. You know, we're just 60,000 people. It's a small place. But it's, it, if you live here, you read the paper, and it's just like year after year after year. It's the same old story about infrastructure and about drugs and about this and about that. Why can't we fix it? We can't fix it because it's upside down. All of our thinking is upside down. So the disciples come along, and they are accused of turning it upside down. But when you turn something upside down that's already upside down, what is it? It's right side up. And so the Bible and the gospel actually allow us to learn how to live right side up lives in a topsy-turvy world. Let me give you some examples. The first is that man says we're a cosmic accident. That's upside down thinking. Do you see how that colors everything? Our view of ourselves and our view of the universe and our view of morality and ethics and everything else. God's right side up view is that we're made in his image. The man says that sin is fun. That's an upside-down view. God says sin is destroying mankind, and he wants to redeem us from it. Upside-down view for man is that if you, if you want to survive, you've got to take care of number one. That's the way it is. God's right-side-up view is that if you want to be first, you must be a person that's willing to die to self and put your trust in God. Man's upside-down view is curse your enemies. Get back at them. God's right-side-up view is bless them. Man's view, upside down, is uh, that if you want to be first, you've got to push and shove, and, and you've got to just climb the ladder. I mean, if you have to hurt some people on the way, so be it. Try to be tactful. Try to keep it low-key. Try to do as little damage as possible. But nonetheless, do what you have to do to climb. And God's view of those that are first are those that are least and the servants of all. That's his right-side-up view. Man's upside-down view is that if you want to be rich... Hoard, collect, gather, and be stingy along the way. That's the only way you're going to do it. God's right side up view is that if you want to be rich, give. Man's upside down view is that the only way you can truly be free is to be in charge of your life. God's right side up view is the only way you can truly be free is to be submitted to his leadership and lordship. Do you see how this is just like the entire world, our entire uh, lens of view and how we address everything is so upside down that we don't even realize it. And when somebody comes along and tells us what's right side up, we think they're upside down. And they were. But when you have two upside downs, you've got a right side up. And God has turned us right side up, those of us that have believed in Christ, and we're still getting it. You know, the thing I want to share with you is that I still have to come back to this every day and I have to read because my views are still upside down sometimes. I forget, you know, and I think to myself, well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that and I have my quiet time and it says, oops, my thinking was upside down and God turns it right side up and then I'm able to function as he wants me to function. It's not natural to us, apart from Christ, to live a right side up life because we're so topsy-turvy because of sin. That's why it's so important that we are people of this book because this is right-side-up thinking. And it contradicts everything that man teaches. But when it comes in, people think it's upside-down, but it's really turning an upside-down world right-side-up. Well, they, they accuse um, them not only of turning the world upside-down, but they also accusing Jason of welcoming Paul and Silas and accuse them of, of uh, defying Caesar's decrees. This is just like, this is like, this is boilerplate stuff that Satan does. You know, if they can't win on logic and if they can't win theologically, let's just, let's slander them. Let's completely accuse them of something false. The Bible tells us that it happened to Ezra. The Bible tells us that it happened to Meshach, uh, Shadrach, and Abednego. It happened to Daniel. It happened to Mordecai. It happened to Jesus, and it happened to Paul, and it's going to happen to us. It's just the way it is. There's going to be false accusation and false slander at times if we're truly on the front line preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, verse 8 and 9 tells us that the response of the crowd and the government officials uh, is they were thrown into turmoil and they made Jason post bond. It's like he had to post bail. What was the bail for? Well, we don't really know, but, uh, but I'm guessing, and many scholars have also guessed, that when Jason posted bond, he was saying that, Jason, you get that Paul guy out of here. You know, we don't want him. He's a ringleader. Get rid of him. 
And you are now personally responsible for quieting this all down. And so Jason has to maybe post $5,000 in our, in our current, you know, money, uh, you know, not, you know, based on the currency of today. For him, it would have been much less, but, you know, that kind of equivalent. And he had to post this bond. And so the Bible tells us that at night, that night, uh, Paul and Silas, under the cover of darkness, left, and they made their way to Berea. Now, I just want to stop here for a second, because this is one of those Romans 8.28 moments where God works everything together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Because from a human standpoint, this was a major setback. You know, having a leader run out of town, that doesn't sound good. It doesn't look good. And, and it's like it's a complete defeat from a human standpoint. But let me, let me suggest a couple of things here um, that are important. And the one I want to kind of focus on is simply this, that if it weren't for Paul being run out of town, he wouldn't have written two epistles to this church, First and Second Thessalonians. Do you realize how important those epistles are? They teach us about the rapture of the church. They teach us about the resurrection of the dead. They teach us about prophecy. They teach us about functioning within the church life. They are enormously important in the body of, of the text of Scripture. And, and Paul, not by his own choice, because he even says in, in uh, First Thessalonians, man, I wanted to be with you. I wanted to come, but Satan wouldn't permit me. And, and he was thinking, the officials were threatening Jason. And he didn't want to risk his bail. He didn't want to risk what God was doing in the church. And he certainly didn't even want to risk his own life, though he was willing to die for Christ. But in all these things, Paul's perspective was is that it was Satan. But behind it all was God. It's the very same thing when Paul was thrown into prison. I mean, that had to be a, 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 a hit in the solar plexus to the church, you know, to see Paul in prison. It's like, oh no, our leader. What's going to happen? Well, you know what happened is he started a, a writing campaign. <laughs> we have 13 of those powerful letters in the New Testament from Paul because things went south. And I want to share something with you briefly. All of us have bad things happen in our life. And we can, uh, we can say, you know, Satan did this or that person did this or whatever, but behind it all, the sovereignty of God reigns supreme and he can turn for good even what Satan meant for evil if we simply put our trust in him. And we have no idea at this moment the glory and the power and the majesty and the, and the advancement of the kingdom of God that lay ahead in the future if we can trust him now in the midst of the darkness. And I want to really encourage you. One of the things that I think is, is most glorifying to God is when we're able to praise him when we don't see what's ahead when we don't know how we'll be delivered, when we don't have any clue how we're going to be extricated from the situation, and yet praise rings from our lips. Worship comes from our heart. Man, I'm telling you, God, that's a powerful, potent form of worship and exalting God, and it lays the groundwork for God to come in powerfully and bring about remarkable results as he did with the Apostle Paul and these disciples. Well, they arrived in Berea, in verse uh, 11, and uh, they went to the synagogue as their custom was, and they found the Bereans, it says, to be of more noble character than the Thessalonians. Of more noble character. That's an interesting thing. I, I think to myself, there aren't too many places in the Bible where someone is given this designation of being noble in character. I'm thinking to myself, I would like God to say that about me. Wouldn't you like that? I mean, or something like it, anything like it? Noble majestic, stately, wonderful, pleasing. These are things that I, I believe every Christian would love to have God say about them. So what was it about the Bereans that warranted this kind of a moniker, this kind of a designation? Well, let's take a look. It tells us that, that they were eager to hear the message. They received this message with great eagerness. It means readiness of mind. They, they weren't empty-headed fools that were just taking in and sucking up whatever Paul said, but they were eager to hear what he said, and they came with an unbiased mind to the truths that Paul was presenting. The second thing that it says they did is they examined the scriptures every day. Examined. It's anacrino. It means to judge. It's the same word that's used of an attorney that would uh, ask questions of a witness in a courthouse. 
So the, the attorney comes and he begins to question, when were you there and what happened and what was said and do you remember the sequence of events and can you tell me more about this? And we go into these details. It's, it's very detailed when you go through a, a court case of any kind and the attorney asks you questions, you've got to be prepared and they're going to ask very detailed questions in order to get the entire picture so that the judge or the jury can have a, a, a full complement of the facts so that they can make a judicial good right decision. And so it says that these saints, these Bereans, examined. They judged it. They were scrutinizing it. They were investigating it. This wasn't a casual examination of the Word of God. These people were digging in. They were, they, I, can, I can see them sitting down with Paul and they were flipping back and forth in the Old Testament and, and going to the prophets and then going back to the very beginning in Genesis 3 when the promise of a Messiah was there. And they were going back and they were investigating and digging in. You know, that takes some effort. We're not talking about a casual... Uh, uh, let's see, I've got to do my Bible reading for today. Let's see. Poop and poop. Oh, I've got a speed read. I'm good at that. And, you know, okay, done. And, okay, thank you, Lord. Bless the day, you know. We're not talking about that. We're talking about people that gave careful investigation to the Scriptures. That's the kind of people that God calls noble. If you want to be noble, that's a part of the package, is that they were men and women that dug into Scripture, studied it, memorized it, meditated on it, learned from what God had to say. The second thing that it also says is that they tested uh, Paul's words against the Bible. Now, you know, that's a funny thing. You know, I mean, we got Apostle Paul, the greatest apostle in the New Testament church, the author of 13 of the epistles in the New Testament. He's the guy that just launched and spearheaded this outreach to both Jew and Gentile. The guy was phenomenal, planted most of the churches in Asia Minor that were planted and this little group of Bereans has the courage and the gall to question the great Apostle Paul. But you know what I find so interesting is that I don't find Paul anywhere saying, you know, you need to submit to leadership. Do you know who I am? Do you know what I've done? I've got, I've already, at this point in, in his life, he already had been beaten, he'd been stoned, all kinds of things. Let me show you my scars. Don't you ever question me. There are a lot of people that are like that. There are leaders that are like that. But the Bible says that's just totally inappropriate. And we don't fall, find Paul responding that way. They tested Paul's words against the Bible. In fact, Paul wasn't uh, offended at all. He, he, he rejoiced in it. And Luke, Dr. Luke, who was one of the disciples following Paul and with Paul, wrote, these guys were more noble-minded, a more noble character. Why? Because they just wouldn't take in what anybody said and not test it against the word of God. We need to test everything. You need to test everything I say. Don't ever accept anything I say up here unless it jives with Scripture. Let me give you some, uh, some questions you can ask whenever you hear something. It's just, oh, I don't know, that just doesn't seem right. I've never really heard that before. That seems strange. And I don't even want to tell you all the strange things that are out there uh, because we'll get waylaid here. But, uh, but here's some questions. If somebody teaches something that's a little different that you've never heard before, is just say, could you show me that in the Bible? You know, that's a basic question. I've had so many people tell me when I've asked them that, hey, Bob, you know, this is a new work of God. This is a rhema word of God. It's not in the Bible. It's a new anointing. And I'm like, okay, well, you just told, you give me the answer right there. This isn't from God, <laughs> you know, because God doesn't take us outside of the realm of his scriptures. Another question is, is this passage being quoted accurately? So many people rip a passage out of context and then build a whole theology around it and it's not even in context and, and they've built a whole theology and a whole ministry and, a, and a tent meetings and all kinds of things that happen. I guess we shouldn't say tent meetings. We're in one. <laughs> <laughs> but it can happen here and so you need to be careful. Uh, it, we need to read in context. We need to know what it says before and what it says afterwards and what it says right there in the, in the context. And, and another question is, how come you're the only one on the whole planet that I've ever heard that has this belief? You know? So we need to test it against, uh, against the centuries of theologians of the past, not being limited to that, but at least looking at it and saying, wait a second, you know, you're the only guy. What, what are the chances that you now are the, are the one that's a revealer of this new truth and no one else on the whole planet after all these millennia of walking with God, they've never heard this, they never knew it before, and now you're the depository of this great truth, you know? Uh, you don't need to be rude or anything, but, uh, but the idea is that question everything. And we need to have that same kind of mentality even with the media and everything. Don't just, don't just believe everything you hear or everything you read. Test it. And especially when it comes to the Word of God, test it against this book because this is the standard for the Christian life. And that's what the early church did. 
And so they were noble because of these things. And they, uh, they, they were eager in the word. They examined it closely. And they tested Paul's words. So these are things that if you want to be noble in the kingdom of God, it lays it out there for us. And so many of you are noble. So many of you are digging in. So many of you are studying and changing and being transformed by the word of God. And I just want to tell you, excel still more. And for those of you that maybe don't know how to study the Bible or it's all new for you, we'll teach you how to study the Bible. Just ask any one of the leaders and we'll take you through a very simple one and a half hour little teaching on how to have a meaningful quiet time that's life transforming and something that's actually manageable for a, a, a person's regular life and schedule. So the Bereans were noble-minded. Well, it tells us in verse 12 that the result is that many Jews believed and again, we have a number of prominent Greek women believing and many Greek men believed. And of course, when there is a response to the message of the gospel and people start getting saved, what's happening next? Persecution. Exactly. Satan is upset again. So what happens? It tells us that the, the Jews from Thessalonica, who gave Paul a hard time 37 miles away, you know, they're going to go over there and they're going to set Paul straight and they're going to make sure everything is squared away and they're going to they're shout him down. It's interesting, when I was in Israel um, this last time, taking a, a group of people from our church there uh, with Arnold Fruchtenbaum, we go into the marketplace and there was a, a, a group evangelizing, singing songs and handing out tracts and everything, all wearing, you know, similar t-shirts about the, uh, the Messiah, about uh, Christ being the Messiah. And, uh, and some Jews heard about it, some Hasidic Jews, and they came with bullhorns and were shouting down the, the, uh, these Christian, uh, these Messianic Jews. And so I was talking to the leader, and he says, yeah, when this happens, this happens every single time, and then we'll just move and relocate, and then we'll relocate, and cell phones and, and internet make it possible for these Hasidic Jews to converge, but they have about maybe 15 to 20 minutes before they're found again. And so they just go around the city uh, traveling, trying to get away from the Hasidic Jews. And that's exactly what's happening here, is that these, these Jews, Jews traveled 37 miles to shout down uh, these disciples. And uh, they were agitating the crowd again, and, and of course the, the disciples responded by sending Paul away. Now, this is exactly what Jesus told the disciples to do. When you're persecuted in one city, just flee to another. Don't, you know, this, you don't, don't die on that hill. You know, God will take care of it. And sure enough, the gospel continued, the gospel was planted, and the gospel flourished despite this persecution. And so they sent Paul off to the, uh, uh, to the coast, and we're going to find him in our next study in Athens. But it's interesting. One last thing I want to point out in verse 15 or 14 and 15 is that he had Silas and Timothy stay at Berea. Do you remember, if you've been in our church any length of time, do you remember the word hupomeno? You guys remember that? Hupo, it's a compound word. Hupo means to be under something, and meno means to remain or stand firm. And so... In, in the other context that we've taught this and come across it in the book of Acts, it means to stand under the pressure and the weight of trials without moving until God lifts it, until God delivers. Because if we do any other way, we're thinking upside down. But God says stay under those trials or under those problems until God delivers. And now Paul is saying, I want you to hupomeno, Timothy and Silas, under the pressure, I want you to stay in Berea and I want you to keep proclaiming the gospel. And you know, ministry, life, child-rearing, marriages, work, all require this capacity to hupomeno. And I taught you the hupomeno dance, right? It's, it's just this, you know? I can't dance very well, so it's perfect for me because you don't have to do the leg thing. You don't have to do the... It's just this, and I can do that. And that's what the Christian life is about. It's staying under the weight of life's trials without finding an escape of your own device and without working the angles, and without saying, I'm through God, I don't want this, you know, but we stay under it for the glory of God until God delivers us. In the meantime, we cry out to him, and when we do, we see his deliverance, and God builds our faith for the next trial, for the next challenge, for the next calling that he has on us. God has called us to be a people that hupomeno, and if you want to be a, a fruitful Christian, which you are, but if you want to grow even more so in that capacity, you have to learn to do the hupomeno. <laughs> There's no way around it. And you're going to have to dance it more often than you want to. But as you do, you're going to learn the joy of dancing the hupomeno as God builds his kingdom through men and women who don't give up, who don't cave in, who don't collapse, who don't run, but persevere in the great work that God has called us to do. I want to close with, with just a couple of questions. 
What are you known for? We have a whole variety of people in this text. They're all known for different things. What are you known for? The number one thing that a man or woman needs to be known for is being known by the name of God. If there's anyone that's never received Christ today, and you're coming and you're visiting, and you're like, I'm not sure what all this is about, what I can tell you is that Jesus is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the one that has, God has already diagnosed the problem. It's sin. God has a remedy for you. It's in his death of Christ on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sins so that you wouldn't have to pay that eternal penalty. And he's inviting you to come into the kingdom of God. And he's saying all you have to do is receive the remedy. It's already paid for. It's bought. It's purchased. It's at the pharmacy of God. And he's made it available. And all that's necessary is to simply pick it up and take the remedy, which is to simply say, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. I've done the wrong things. I've been upside down in my thinking. And I want you to forgive me and I want a new start. But there's also, for the rest of us that have been believers for some time, another aspect of this reputation issue. The Bible tells us in, in uh, Revelation chapter 2, when he's addressing the church in Ephesus, he says, I know your deeds. And you see, and he's not rebuking them. It's like, I know what you've done, and I'm coming after you. No, he's, he's, he's lauding them. He's congratulating them. He's celebrating with them because of their deeds and their hard work in the faith. And I want to say to you as well, God knows your deeds. This island is becoming aware of your deeds and your hard work and your love and your compassion and your kindness in this community. And it's having an impact. And I want to tell you and encourage you to let that reputation continue to grow as you serve the Lord in these days that we live in. We are in a very, very, very exciting time and God has so many things ahead for not just us, but for the kingdom of God on this island and beyond. Don't sit on the sidelines. Don't let lesser things consume your time and your energy and your resources. Give yourself first to God. That's right side up thinking. And he will take care of the rest. Man's thinking is, is it take care of yourself first and then give the leftover to God. That's upside down thinking. It leads to death. And even for Christians, it leads to a subpar experience. Certainly not the abundant life that God has promised. So let's walk in the abundance by living what the world says is upside down but two upside downs makes right side up. And in a topsy-turvy world, we're learning how to live right side up lives for the glory of Christ. Father, we thank you for this time and we just rejoice in what you've done. And I pray that you would continue to do your great work on this island in our lives. And God, that we would be of those of noble character, like the Bereans, like these women who responded so eagerly, like the Jews that responded, like the Greeks that responded. And may you find in us an eagerness to study your word, that we, we would be those that would investigate and examine. It says they did it daily, not once a week or three times a week, but every day they dug in and they examined things. And help us not to be afraid to be questioned or to question that we might know the truth. And I pray that the outcome would be that we would be men and women that would be forceful and that we would be effective and that we would be fruitful in advancing the kingdom of God in the areas and the ministries and the venues that you've placed us. And we pray all these things to your glory and your praise. In Jesus' name, amen.